This is section three of Gospel of Dionysus. Let's go down to our next section here. Bacchae 356 to 359. So again, this is a prophet Tiresias prophesying about this new God man again. He says, apart from wine, there is no cure for human hardship. He indeed being a God is poured out to the gods. So that way human beings receive benefits. There are three very key points of this this, this uh, uh, verse here in the Bacchae. Okay, but let's read Matthew 26, 28 first. It says, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, human beings receiving benefits. So please follow along here. You have three different things here within these verses that are, are identical. Okay. So the prophet Tiresias says about Dionysus. Remember, he Dionysus is the god of wine. Apart from wine, Dionysus, who is the wine, apart from wine, there is no cure for human hardship. Just like in the Gospels, for this, the wine is my blood of the covenant. Okay. Then look at the second part. Dionysus, wine, is poured out to the gods. Just as this wine in the Eucharist is Jesus is poured out for many. The same Greek word for poured out are the same. That's amazing. The third one are the same. So with Dionysus, this has happened. The wine or blood is poured out, okay? For, for human hardship, it is poured out to the gods, just as the blood or wine of the covenant is poured out for many in the Gospels. Why? In the Gospels, it's for forgiveness of sins. So human beings receive benefits from this. Okay, forgiveness of sin. Just like that way, the Bacchae, so that way human beings receive benefits. Notice Tiresias says that there is no, apart from wine, there is no cure. Just like the wine or blood of Jesus, outside of that, there is no cure. You remember, Jesus said, you have to drink this. Or you're not one of me. Okay, this is required for everlasting life. This is was tailored off the sacrificial feast of Dionysus. Point by point are exact match of uh, 100%. Let's go down to Bacchae 377. So this is Tiresias still, the prophet. He says, this God Dionysus is a prophet as well. <clears throat> okay, look at John 9, 17. He said he is a prophet. So just like both Dionysus and Jesus are considered son of God, they are also are both considered a prophet as well, as both uh, uh, religious texts uh, conclude. Just another one of those small little tidbits that are the same. Go down to Bacchae 380 to 382. So Tiresias here is still speaking, but at this point in the story, Tiresias compares to that of John the Baptist. Watch what Tiresias says and does here. It mirrors what John the Baptist would do four and a half centuries later. <clears throat> Tiresias says, when the God fully enters human bodies, he makes them become prophets, who they speak of what is to come in the future days. Okay, look at John 133. This is about John the Baptist, of course. But he sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. The same is he who baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Also, Matthew 3, 2. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay. So, Tiresias <clears throat> says when the God fully enters the human body, okay, just like the Spirit remains on him per gospel account. Okay, talk about Jesus, uh, the spirit remaining on him in the in the gospel account, just like God enters the human bodies in the Greek account. Then they become prophets once this happens, according to the Bacchae, just as once the spirit is within you. Now, Jesus will baptize with the Holy Ghost. Okay, it's a better it, it, now that God or the spirit is in him. He's able to baptize with the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Notice that. John the Baptist now preaches that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He prophesies now, just as in the Bacchae, when the God fully enters the human body, he then becomes a prophet. 
And now he's able to speak of what is to come in the future days. Just like John the Baptist speaks of what is to come in the future days. The kingdom of, the hev kingdom of heaven is at hand to repent that, that it's all about to come to an end. Amazing. You know, Bacchae 451 to 454. So <clears throat> Pentheus here is talking to his soldiers before he enters his palace. <clears throat> okay. So this is kind of a like a pep rally. He's telling his soldiers what to do here before Pentheus walks back into his palace. He says, if you get him, Dionysus, tie him up and bring him here for judgment, a death by stoning. That way he will see his rights and Thebes come to an end. Compare this to Matthew 26, 14 through 16. Judas Iscariot says, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? John 8, 59. At this, they picked up stones to throw at him. John 18, 2. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers. Okay, okay. so let, let's, let's make sure we understand the context here. In Matthew, Judas Iscariot is set out to betray Jesus. So what will you give me if I turn him over to you? Okay, and this is all about getting the soldiers uh, uh, ready here. Caffius rallied up the soldiers here, guiding a detachment of soldiers to come to go to the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. Just like in the Bacchae, Pentheus is telling the soldiers when they go here to arrest uh, Dionysus, to tie him up and bring him back for judgment. Just like Caffius orders the soldiers to go to the Garden of Gethsemane to get Jesus, a detachment of soldiers, to arrest Jesus and bring him back for judgment. Same exact thing. We also see that Pentheus uh, says that a death by stoning, just as Jesus is continually threatened to be stoned to death. Look at John 8, 59. They picked up stones to throw at him. Same exact context here. And this is going to become even more evident here shortly. But just, that's the imagery. The gospel imagery, the high priest Caffius is telling these soldiers to, to go rest Jesus, to, to, to bind him up and bring him back here for judgment. Just like Pentheus is telling his soldiers to, to go rest Dionysus, to bind him up and bring him back here for judgment. Now, as far as Judas Iscariot goes, the one that betrays Jesus, this is going to become more evident here in just a second. Go to Bacchae 484. <clears throat> says here, this is the followers of Dionysus saying this, to, he, to bring all sorrows to an end. This, amongst others, is what Dionysus wants to give. Compare this to Revelation 21.4. And God will wipe away all their tears from their eyes, and there will be no more sorrow. What's key here is this is the followers or disciples of Dionysus or Jesus saying this, that Dionysus wants to bring all sorrows to an end. This is something Dionysus wants to give. Just like Jesus wants to wipe away all their tears and there will be no more sorrow. The same Greek word for sorrow, of course, is used in both accounts. So this another little tidbit here of a little small story applied to the character are the same. And it's who is saying this is the same. Disciple of Jesus or disciple of Dionysus, are both saying that he wants to bring all sorrows to an end, or there will be no more sorrow, wipe away all their tears, same exact thing. We got a Bagai 485 to 488. So again, this is the followers of Dionysus saying this again. At the god Dionysus' sacrificial feast, when the gleaming liquid grapes arrive, the wine, when the wine bowl uh, sheds its sleep on ivory-covered feasting men, Okay, so this is this this is the heart of the story of the sacrificial feast again. Okay, let's read John two ten. Every man serves the good wine first, and when the when the guests are drunk, then he serves a poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Plus John six fifty six. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. This is so precise that it should blow you away. If it doesn't, reread it again. There are two steps in both. At the sacrificial feast of Dionysus, where this wine and bread are served, when the wine arrives, okay, this is the first step. When the wine arrives, then it's given. Then it sheds sleep on the ivory-covering feasting men, okay? They become drunk, 
Okay, they 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 they, they become drunk or they are shed to sleep. That's the second one. So you have the deliverance of the first wine. They consume it. Now they become drunk and and or and go to sleep. Okay, just as in John two ten, they serve the good wine first. And guess what? When the guests are drunk, just like Dionysus' uh, sacrificial feast, the the wine arrived and they drank and became drunk. Then this then he serves the poor wine. The second part. So even there's two steps in both the Dionysian sacrificial feast and the Eucharist here. Absolutely amazing. That's why his whole wine and bread being served at a feast is just completely Dionysian cult ritual. It is uh, one of the easiest things to see. Good on a Buckeye, 500 to 502. It's again the followers of Dionysus. They say, our life is brief. That's why the man who chases greatness fails to grasp what's near at hand. Compare this to James 4.14. You do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So again, this is consistent in both stories. <laughs> this is again the follower or disciple of Dionysus, the follower or disciple of Jesus saying this, that our life is brief, okay? It's, it's, it's a vapor that vanishes away. You look at the text in both of them and they're identical in both, both aspects. So it's not only the big stories that are the same. But it's also the little stories are the same in context. And then, of course, the most important thing, whether it's the Iliad, the Odyssey, or here at the Bacchae, it's the theme. The theme is the same throughout the stories. It's just the name of the character has changed, and usually a little bit of mimesis is put on there to make the newer character of Jesus a little bit better version. Let's go down to Bacchae 535 and 536. Again, the followers of Dionysus here again. They say, he, Dionysus, removes intelligence, their knowledge of true wisdom. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 1.19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. So okay, here in 1 Corinthians, this is an authentic epistle of Paul. And he's saying that through Jesus, that the wisdom of the wise are going to be destroyed, and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. It was all about the, the lowly, humble... Uh, uneducated that would have the truth, not the intelligent ones. This all stems from the Dionysian cult. Okay, as as you can see here in Bacchae five thirty five and five thirty six, that Dionysus removes the intelligence, their knowledge of true wisdom. So in both accounts, the demigod is responsible for taking away the intelligence of man. And it's a disciple or follower of the God that makes this claim in both stories. That is an absolute remarkable parallel there. Good out of Buckeye 544 to 552. So this is a band of soldiers <clears throat> delivering Dionysus to the palace. Okay, the, the soldiers had arrested Dionysus and now have taken him back to the palace of Pentheus. It says, he Dionysus surrendered willingly without turning pale or changing color on those wine dark cheeks. They tied him up and led him off. Dionysus stood still, making it easier for me to take him in. I said, stranger, I don't want to do this. I don't want to take you in, but I must because I'm under orders from King Pentheus who sent me. So this soldier of Pentheus arrested and tied up Dionysus, but he didn't want to. But he had to. He was remorseful for this. And now they are tying up Dionysus and leading him back to uh, the palace of Pentheus. Take a look at John 18.11. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Also John 18, 12. Then the detachment of soldiers arrested Jesus. They bound him and first brought him to Annas, the father-in-law to Capias, who was a high priest that year. In Matthew 27, 3. When Judas saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. So Judas Iscariot is the main villain here that, of course, sells out Jesus and shows the soldiers where uh, Jesus is, okay? But Judas becomes remorseful for this and, of course, ends up committing suicide. There's two different uh, contradictory accounts of that. But he commits suicide because he was remorseful, just like the soldier of Pentheus was remorseful for arresting Dionysus. He didn't want to do it. And you have this image of the soldiers coming to Dionysus to arrest him, bind him up, to lead him back to a trial that will await him. Just like the soldiers will go to arrest Jesus. 
to bind him up, tie him up, and lead him back for judgment uh, and a trial. And then there's one other key part of the story that is the same. Remember when Jesus, at Gethsemane, Peter pulled out his sword and was going to fight these soldiers. Jesus said, put your, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? In other words, Jesus went peacefully. He didn't put up a fight. He didn't run. Just like Dionysus has said in the Buckeye, that he surrendered willingly. Didn't put up a fight or run. It is, bam. I mean, absolutely the same exact story tailored off the Buckeye. Absolutely incredible. And it's only going to get better from this point forward. That's going to do it for this segment. Uh, please, from the other side, we will continue over there.